The International Trade Secretary Liam Fox has admitted that new trade deals with dozens of the world's biggest economies may not be ready in time for Brexit. Boris Johnson has falsely claimed that he never mentioned the issue of Turkey and its hopes of joining the EU during the referendum campaign. There are calls in Washington tonight for a full investigation into reports that President Trump ordered his lawyer to lie to Congress about contacts with Russia. Dramatic details have emerged about the road accident involving the Duke of Edinburgh and a car carrying two women and a nine-month-old baby boy. Also tonight, long jail terms for three arsonists who killed five people in Leicester, and Ian Paisley Jr. admits billing a charity for a first-class flight to New York. The International Trade Secretary Liam Fox has admitted that Britain is dependent on other countries to ensure the trade deals the EU has around the world still apply here after Brexit. With 10 weeks to go until the UK is due to leave, not one of the 40 agreements that would be needed has been finalised. The list of countries includes Japan and Canada, which are both in the G7 group of leading economies. Dr Fox's comment appears to contradict a pledge he made after the Brexit process was initiated nearly two years ago, as our business correspondent John T. Bloom explains. In 2017, Liam Fox confidently predicted that the UK would have up to 40 free trade deals ready for one second after midnight on the day we leave the EU, so that there would be no disruption to trade. But with just two months to go until Brexit, not a single one has been agreed. The Department for International Trade says some are at an advanced stage, but today Dr Fox admitted the UK was now dependent on other countries' willingness to act quickly. Our side is ready. It's uh, largely dependent on whether other countries um, believe that there will be no deal and are willing to put the work into the preparations. The closest the UK has come to replacing a free trade deal is an initial agreement with Switzerland to replicate the existing EU-Switzerland arrangements as far as possible. But that deal has not been formally signed yet and the details of what as far as possible means are still not clear. The EU has numerous free trade agreements with countries like Israel, South Korea, South Africa, Mexico and Canada amongst others. A deal with Japan starts next month. Also, if we leave the EU with no deal on March the 29th, there will be no two-year transition period for firms to prepare for Brexit, and we'll have to trade under World Trade Organization rules, something the Japanese ambassador to the UK, Toji Tsurioka, says would make things more difficult for Japanese firms. During the transition period, uh, the companies that have invested here in UK were expecting that they'll be able to adapt to the future mechanism of continuing to do operation here in UK. No deal means the WTO rules are going to be in place instead of the preferential frictionless uh, flow of goods and services between uh, UK and EU. It is far from impossible to do business under WTO terms. They are, after all, designed to facilitate international trade. But many foreign firms came here precisely so they could take advantage of the far better terms and conditions the single market provides. And the EU has negotiated around 40 free trade agreements with other countries because they are far better than WTO rules as well. Theresa May has been meeting members of her cabinet to discuss how to move the Brexit process forward. She's also held talks with senior officials in Brussels, including the European Council President Donald Tusk, who said afterwards that the next steps were on the British side. Mrs May will make a common statement on Monday after MPs emphatically rejected her withdrawal plan earlier this week. More details from our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake. Just as the MPs who met Theresa May yesterday have different opinions on Brexit, so too do members of her cabinet. That may be why she chose to meet them individually or in small groups today to discuss the talks she had with opposition parties and what Downing Street described as the next steps. The Environment Secretary Michael Gove, Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt and Penny Mordaunt, the International Development Secretary, were among those meeting the Prime Minister. On the issue of whether the UK could remain in a permanent customs union with the EU, for example, the International Trade Secretary Liam Fox said this morning that doing so would not be delivering Brexit and it would prevent Britain having independent trade policies. Earlier this week, the Justice Secretary David Gork said the government shouldn't box itself in by ruling that out. 
Theresa May spoke to the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, by phone this afternoon. He said the pair discussed the next steps on the UK side. On Monday, the Prime Minister will make a statement to Parliament and put forward a motion for debate which may then be amended, providing MPs with an opportunity to test support in the House of Commons for various versions of an outcome to Brexit. The former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has denied that he ever talked about possible Turkish membership of the EU during the Brexit referendum campaign in 2016. Mr Johnson was asked about the issue after making a speech today in Staffordshire. In fact, he raised the issue of Turkey on a number of occasions. The Shadow Business Secretary Chuka Amuna described Mr Johnson's comment as yet another lie he's been caught out on. Here's our reality check correspondent Chris Morris. Boris Johnson said he hadn't talked about Turkey during the referendum campaign. Since I made no remarks, he said, I can't disown them. In fact, he had done so on several occasions, pointing out correctly that it was official government policy for Turkey to join the EU. A week before the Brexit vote, he was also the co-signatory of a letter to the Prime Minister, which spoke of the rapidly accelerating pace of Turkey's accession negotiations. Mr Johnson, whose great-grandfather was Turkish, was a leading member of the Vote Leave campaign, which produced a poster with the slogan, Turkey, population 76 million, is joining the EU. Vote Leave, take back control. It became a controversial issue because Vote Leave suggested that Turkish accession could be imminent and that millions of Turks could soon travel to the UK. But Turkey's long-standing application for EU membership had been stuck in the slow lane for years, and it's no nearer joining the EU now than it was a decade ago. Leading figures in Germany have written an open letter to Britain imploring it to stay in the EU. Signatories include the leader of the Christian Democrats and likely successor to the Chancellor Angela Merkel, Anna Great Kramp Karrenbauer. The letter says that without Britain, Europe would not be what it is today, a community defined by freedom and prosperity. Our Berlin correspondent Jenny Hill reports. Germany is watching in fascinated horror as Britain grapples with the complexities of leaving the EU. It's a decision many Germans regret. Most hold the UK, an important political and economic ally, in high regard and with genuine affection. In a letter to the Times, leading establishment figures explained why. Britain has become part of who we are as Europeans and therefore we would miss Britain. We would miss the legendary British black humour and going to the pub after work hours to drink an ale. We would miss tea with milk and driving on the left-hand side of the road. And we would miss seeing the panto at Christmas. The letter, which implores Britain to change its mind, comes as Germany prepares for the possibility of a no-deal Brexit. Industrialists, in particular car manufacturers, have warned of dire consequences. But the timing of the intervention also suggests that those who have for some time nurtured the secret hope that Britain might reconsider now see that as a genuine possibility. Angela Merkel's name is notably absent from the letter. The Chancellor, who spoke to Theresa May by telephone yesterday, tends to restrict her public comments about Brexit, aware that she's open to accusations of interference. Instead, the most senior signatory is Annegret Kramp Karrenbauer, the politician viewed as Mrs Merkel's possible successor. But the Chancellor is likely to have supported the sentiment and perhaps even the intervention itself. Democratic politicians in Washington say they will investigate claims that President Trump directed his former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress. A report by BuzzFeed News alleges that Mr. Trump told Cohen to lie about plans to build a tower in Moscow. Mr. Trump has previously denied ever directing Cohen to break the law. His former personal lawyer is facing a three-year prison sentence for violating campaign finance laws and has pleaded guilty to lying to Congress about the Russian Trump Hotel project. Here's our North America editor, John Sopel. In the slew of recent reports about Donald Trump and Russia, this is potentially the most serious and threatening to the White House. Although the president's surrogates will dismiss Michael Cohen as a proven liar, and Donald Trump this morning tweeted he was lying to reduce his jail time, this is different. Because this isn't the result of a claim from Donald Trump's former lawyer and Mr Fixit. According to BuzzFeed, it's the result of documents and texts obtained and interviews conducted by the special counsel Robert Mueller, which were then put to Cohen. The allegation is that Donald Trump told Cohen to lie when he went before Congress about the president's business dealings with Moscow. 
Cohen told lawmakers that efforts to build a Trump hotel stopped in January 2016. But it's since emerged those efforts continued. The White House Deputy Press Secretary, Hogan Gidley, was sent out to ridicule the story. But he didn't actually deny it. This is just another in a so long you're, you're line of ridiculous the, charges without any corroboration you, or credibility you're whatsoever. You're saying the president did not tell Michael Cohen to do that? I'm telling you right now, this is exactly why the president refuses uh, to give any credence or credibility to news outlets, because they have no uh, ability to corroborate anything they're putting out there. Instead, they're just using innuendo and well, that, shady that sources. A, that was not a denial of my question. No, the, the, but, but, but the premise is ridiculous. If there is evidence that when he was president, Donald Trump told Cohen to lie, that could amount to obstruction of justice, one of the high crimes and misdemeanors that could lead to impeachment. The chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, called these allegations the most serious to date. The White House says President Trump has held a meeting with the North Korean envoy Kim Young-chul. The talks follow what the State Department described as a good discussion between Mr Kim and the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. It's hoped a series of meetings will lead to a second summit between Mr Trump and the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. There's been little progress on denuclearization since the two leaders met in Singapore last year. Norfolk police say that the car accident involving the Duke of Edinburgh near the Sandringham estate will be investigated and any appropriate action taken. The prince, who's 97, was shaken when his car rolled over in the collision yesterday. Two other people required hospital treatment. An eyewitness, Roy Warren, helped the Duke from his car and also rescued a baby from another vehicle. It emerged that the Duke visited hospital this morning for a precautionary checkup on his doctor's advice. Our Royal Correspondent Johnny Diamond reports. That the Duke was not injured in this collision now appears to have been very good fortune. Roy Warren describes seeing the Duke's Land Rover go out of control after it collided with another vehicle, a Kia, that was coming down the A149 near Sandringham. I saw it careering, tumbling across the road on the other side. Massive force and it, and it had rolled on the other side as well. The Duke's Land Rover ended up resting on the driver's side of the car with severe damage to the windscreen and the roof. The Duke was trapped, his legs tangled beneath the steering wheel. Mr Warren says that in the Kia there were two women in the front seats and in the back a baby unhurt. We got the baby out and then I went to the black car to help and realised it was Duke of Edinburgh. I asked him to move his left leg and that freed his right leg, and then I helped him get out. Um, he was sh obviously shaken, and then he went and asked if the, everyone else was all right. The women in the passenger and driver seats of the Kia were hurt, a broken wrist and some cuts. They were taken to hospital. The prince, though shaken, was not injured. He remains at Sandringham with the Queen. In a move planned before yesterday's collision, Norfolk County Council met today and agreed to lower the speed limit on the A149 from 60 to 50 miles per hour and install speed cameras. The Duke is reported to have told police that he had been dazzled by the sun. The police have said that both drivers were breathalyzed and neither were over the limit. The collision will, Norfolk police say, be investigated. The DUP MP Ian Paisley has been criticised for billing a charity nearly £6,000 to fly first class to an event in New York. Mr Paisley had been invited to a conference marking two decades since the Good Friday Agreement by the organisation Cooperation Ireland. Previously, he received a suspension from the House of Commons after failing to declare two luxury family holidays to Sri Lanka paid for by the country's government. From Belfast, here's our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy. It's understood Mr Paisley accepted an invite to speak at the event in New York at the last minute and was only able to be in the US for a short time. He later billed the charity £5,925 for first-class flights and £400 for the hotel. Other high-profile speakers, such as the Irish Deputy Prime Minister Simon Coveney, flew economy, which was more than ten times cheaper. There are also claims that Mr Paisley's bill included the cost of a limousine service to the airport, but he disputes this. It's the latest occasion on which Ian Paisley has faced questions over claims of a lavish lifestyle. Last year, he was suspended for 30 days from the Commons after failing to declare luxury holidays paid for by the Sri Lankan government, which he later lobbied on behalf of. 
and there are calls for the Parliamentary Standards Committee to investigate a complimentary holiday he received at a luxury Maldives resort after advocating on behalf of its government. Mr Paisley has denied the trip was connected with the Maldives government and said it was funded by a friend. The leader of an opposition party in Northern Ireland, the SDLP, has called on Ian Paisley to pay back the money for the New York event. You're listening to the 6 o'clock news on BBC Radio 4. The main news so far. The International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, has admitted that new trade deals with dozens of leading economies around the world may not be in place in time for Brexit. Democrats in Washington say they will investigate new allegations that Mr Trump ordered his lawyer to lie to Congress about contacts with Russia. Still to come... Lots of interest, lots of different offers, um, and I think I've picked the option which is good for me and everybody. A windfall for the owner of the most famous garage in Port Talbot. Three men who murdered five people in an arson attack on a shop in Leicester city centre have been jailed for life. Aaron Kurd and Arkan Ali were each imprisoned for 38 years, Halka Hassan for 33 years. Leicester Crown Court heard how they carried out the plot as part of an insurance fraud, knowing full well that people were inside the building. Our Midlands correspondent Seema Katecha was in court. Witnesses described the explosion that ripped through the building in central Leicester in February last year as sounding like a bomb going off. It completely destroyed the supermarket and the two-storey flat above it. Five people, including a mother and her two teenage sons, were killed. The men guilty of their murder, Aram Kurd, who's 33, Hauka Hassan, who's 32, and 37-year-old Arkan Ali, stared straight ahead as they were sentenced this afternoon. Every so often, Kurd wiped away tears. The court had heard that they had deliberately caused the explosion as part of a plan to profit from a false insurance claim. They poured more than 40 litres of petrol into the basement of the shop. They even allowed their friend, Victoria E. Evlova, who was inside the building, to die because they felt she knew too much about their plan. Leah Reek was also killed in the explosion. Her parents, John and Joe Reek, said life would never be the same again. I don't think we've ever... I don't think we've connected... I don't think you ever get over. No. It's still not real, if you know what I mean. We know she's gone, but to see her walk out of the house and never ever see her again... Yeah. It just hurts. It hurts all the time, don't it? Yeah. In court today, the couple wept as details about the fire were read out. Jose Ragabir's wife Mary and his two teenage sons, Sean and Shane, were also killed in the explosion. At one point he had to leave the courtroom to compose himself after becoming visibly upset. He had told the court that he and his wife had come to England for a better life and now his hopes and dreams had been shattered. The judge, Mr Justice Holgate, said none of the defendants had shown remorse for their wicked crimes. He described Kurd and Ali as highly manipulative and cunning individuals, while Hassan, he said, played an important but lesser role in plotting the fire. Violent clashes between protesters and security forces have continued in Sudan. Reports from the capital Khartoum say police opened fire at hundreds of people mourning the death of a man killed during anti-government demonstrations. The protests began last month, initially in response to price rises, but have quickly turned to anger directed at the president, Omar al-Bashir. Human rights groups say at least 40 people have been killed so far. Our Africa editor, Fergal Keane, reports. <laughs> The anger and the grief among crowds who have continued to protest, despite the threat from live ammunition being fired by President al-Bashir's security forces. The culture of fear which might once have stopped such demonstrations has evaporated in many areas. The imagery now circulating on social media shows crowds challenging the guns and whips of the state, in one case overturning a police car. Here, as stones are hurled, shots ring out. A young man is hit and falls to the ground. Some of the most intense repression in recent weeks has taken place around medical facilities. At the Royal Care Hospital in the Khartoum district of Buri last night, staff described being trapped inside and how one doctor was shot when he went out to plead with the security forces. 
This is the voice of one of his colleagues. They said, OK, you can keep approaching us, but we're ready to talk to you. And when he came close, he started explaining that he's a medical doctor. The, the response he got was simply, you are a medical doctor. Well, we are looking for you. And they took two steps back and they just fired him. They just shot him and then went away. President al-Bashir stands accused not only of brutality, but of economic misrule. Soaring inflation, including the tripling of bread prices, has led to widespread despair. And so the state is meeting resistance on a scale that is unprecedented. It's now a month since the first protests, and there is no sign they'll fade away. Human rights groups in Zimbabwe say at least 12 people have been killed during days of violent protests. For another day, the authorities shut down all internet access across the country. The opposition says hundreds of people have been arrested and many more beaten and tortured by security forces. The protests were sparked by a sharp rise in the price of fuel. Five men and a woman have appeared in court in Kenya in connection with Tuesday's attack on a hotel complex in Nairobi. 21 people died in a siege lasting almost 20 hours. The suspects were not charged but have been remanded in custody while investigations continue. Rupert Murdoch's newspapers, The Times and The Sunday Times, are asking the government for permission to share resources, including journalists, between the two titles. The papers employ about 500 people between them. The National Union of Journalists says it fears there could be job cuts. Our business correspondent Rob Young reports. At the beginning of the last decade, the Sunday Times sold about 1.4 million copies a week. Now that number has halved. Far fewer people get inky fingers in the morning, preferring to tap and swipe rather than turn a page. Rupert Murdoch's News UK has called that a seismic change. There is a growing number of digital readers and subscribers. However, News UK says an increase in the amount it earns online hasn't offset dwindling revenues from selling print copies and advertising. The Times and Sunday Times together remain profitable, but they're trying to persuade the government to change one of the legal undertakings Mr Murdoch made when he bought the papers back in 1981. They want to scrap a promise not to share news resources, arguing that would remove what they call unnecessary duplication in costs, allowing journalists to work for both titles. The National Union of Journalists says it's concerned about the impact shared content will have on journalism and on journalists, fearing job cuts. To the relief of Mr Murdoch's many critics, the newspapers aren't looking to remove a rule meant to protect the papers from editorial interference by the proprietor. The government says it will announce a decision on Monday. The parents of a two-year-old girl who died of malnutrition have been jailed for more than six years at the High Court in Glasgow. Lauren Wade was emaciated and riddled with head lice when she died in 2015. Last month, 38-year-old Margaret Wade and her partner Marie Sweeney admitted willful ill-treatment and neglect. Researchers in Oxford have found that people from ethnic minority backgrounds face significant levels of discrimination when applying for jobs. The study carried out by the Centre for Social Investigation showed that candidates from these backgrounds had to send, on average, 60% more applications to get a similar response from employers as their white counterparts. Rihanna Croxford reports. More than 3,000 fake job applications were sent to British employers over a one-year period. The jobs included software engineers, chefs and shop assistants. The fictitious candidates were all British citizens and had identical years of experience, CVs and covering letters. The only thing the researchers changed was the applicant's name and ethnicity, with stark degrees of success. While 24% of white applicants received a positive callback from an employer, only 15% of those from ethnic minority backgrounds did. The success rates for people of black, South Asian and Muslim heritage was as low as 12%. Dr. Valentina de Stasio, who carried out the report, says it shows that levels of discrimination in the labour market hasn't changed much since the late 1960s. She says it suggests that employers may simply read no further as soon as they see a Middle Eastern or African sounding name. A BBC News editor has been cleared of naming the victim of a sexual offence in a live broadcast. Araf Ansari, who's the head of news at the BBC Asian Network, checked and approved a reporter's script in a rape trial that named the victim wrongly stating it was a pseudonym. Such victims are automatically given lifetime anonymity by the law. 
From Sheffield Magistrates Court, Danny Savage reports. When BBC journalist Rickin Majitia came to Sheffield last February to report on a rape case, he listened to the evidence in court, genuinely believing the victim was being referred to by a pseudonym. That evening, in a live broadcast, he reported her name. He was quickly alerted to the mistake. Mr Majitia rang his editor, Arif Ansari, in a state of panic, saying, I've got the name wrong. It wasn't a pseudonym. It was her real name. Mr Ansari had checked and approved the script, which is why he was charged with naming the victim under the Sexual Offences Amendment Act. Today, a district judge at Sheffield Magistrates cleared Mr Ansari, saying he had made an honest mistake. It's highly unusual for an individual, rather than their employer, to be prosecuted in cases such as this. The BBC had previously apologised for the serious mistake, but also raised concerns that prosecuting a journalist could create a climate of fear for editors reporting in the public interest. Retail sales dropped in December by 0.9% compared with the month before. The fall would have been more pronounced if it weren't for growth in fuel and food sales. The latest figures from the Office for National Statistics suggest a change in the habits of shoppers, as our economics correspondent Darshini David reports. The latest figures confirm that an increasing amount of Christmas spending is now done in November, as shoppers take advantage of Black Friday bargains. But when the previous few months are taken into account, these numbers form a worrying picture. Brands such as Marks and & Spencer and Debenhams recently revealed that the run-up to Christmas was disappointing overall and that consumer spending lost momentum across last year. Retail spending accounts for about a quarter of GDP and has fallen by 0.2% in the final three months of 2018. Economists worry this will have dampened overall growth and blame uncertainty about Brexit and weak real income growth for consumers' caution. In the city, the 100 chair index ended the day 134 points higher at 6,968. A short time ago on Wall Street, the Dow Jones was up 474 points at 24,862. On the currency markets, the pound was down three-tenths of a cent against the dollar at $1.29. Against the euro, sterling was unchanged at €1.13.6, making a euro worth 88 pence. The latest work by Banksy, which has drawn tens of thousands of visitors to a garage in Port Talbot, has been sold to a gallery in Essex. It was bought for what's been described as a six-figure sum. But the piece, called Season's Greetings, will stay in South Wales for the foreseeable future. Our reporter, Will Fife, has been to see the piece and speak to its owners. Since the artwork first appeared down a tiny side street in this industrial town just before Christmas, it's caused quite a stir. The mural was Banks's first in Wales, but with the excitement also came a cry for help from the steel worker whose garage Banksy had chosen to paint over. Ian Lewis had previously spoken about how he could no longer cope with looking after the painting. But he says since the first day the graffiti was confirmed as genuine, he's had no shortage of buyers. Lots of interest, lots of different offers um, uh, and a lot of options for me, some of which I liked, um, some of them which I wasn't keen on, to be honest with you. And I think I've picked the option which is good for me and everybody. But while Mr Lewis has apparently received a six-figure sum, he says it wasn't the highest amount of money he was offered, but instead the only deal that ensured Season's Greetings stayed in the area. The artwork's new owner, John Brandler, says he's keen to see it continue to be used to benefit the town. I am absolutely delighted to own it. It's taken a couple of weeks of negotiations to get it, and I am going to be lending it to Port Talbot for a minimum of two, three years. This is where it belongs. Hopefully we're going to create an art centre around it, bringing in people like Damien Hurst and Black Lorette and, and more Bankses. The agreement is that the garage walls containing the artwork will now be carefully removed from their current site and relocated closer to the heart of Port Alban, where it's hoped the work will continue to be a draw for tourists. The headlines again. The International Trade Secretary Liam Fox has admitted that the trade deals the UK needs if it leaves the EU without a deal have not been finalised. The former Shadow Business Secretary Chuka Amuna has accused Boris Johnson of lying after he said he never mentioned the issue of Turkey and its hopes of joining the EU during the referendum campaign. 
Senior Democrats in the U.S. have vowed to investigate allegations that President Trump told his former lawyer Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. Witnesses have been describing the road accident involving the Duke of Edinburgh and a car carrying two women and a nine-month-old baby boy. BBC News.